Hey, I'm sorry to interrupt this, but I can't start this video with that type of music. It's just so heavy. Welcome to U.S. History with Lennox, and today we're going back to the era of good feelings. That's right. We're going to the presidency of James Monroe. Now, in my last video, I introduced you to James Monroe and this era of good feelings, but we want to get a little deeper into it this time. So we're actually going to go back into Madison's presidency when this whole thing got started right after the War of 1812. And he's going to introduce a plan into our country that's going to play a big role into building our country up and also create some controversy along the way. So come on, let's go. Let's get into this era of good feelings. All right, the very first thing I want to talk about is Henry Clay's American system. Now, this is going to be introduced during James Madison's presidency, during his second term. And it's all centered around nationalism. It's all about making the United States stronger and better. There's three key parts to the American system. One is a national bank. The first bank of the United States created by Hamilton's financial plan in 1891 expired in 1811. So we're without a national bank at this point. Second part is internal improvements, often called infrastructure, the building of roads and canals and bridges helps with transportation across the country. And finally, a protective tariff. Now, we've been introduced to this before, again, through Hamilton's financial plan, but the idea with the protective tariff is is going to protect our domestic manufacturing. Coming out of the War of 1812, America had become self-sufficient, and the rise of industry was occurring during this time, and we wanted to protect those manufacturers, and the protective tariff is the way to do that. Now, some of the components of the American system seem awfully familiar, don't they? Don't they sound a lot like Hamilton's financial plan? Henry Clay's American system is really using Hamilton's financial plan, I think, as a model, especially with regards to a bank and the tariffs. And so as we move forward, we're going to see how these Democratic Republicans, these folks that fell in line with the Jeffersonian model of governing, how they're going to deal with this because, you know, Madison was a Democratic Republican and Monroe is a Democratic Republican. So when you look at this, this is not a Jeffersonian idea. It's really a Hamiltonian idea being introduced in a Jeffersonian political scenario. Go figure. There's a lot of sectionalism going on in our country, and I want to take a minute just to break down why this American system is going to be debated in our country. And a lot of it has to do with the desires and the needs of each section of our country. As you look at the North, the South, and the West, these are the predominant regions of our country. The North depended on commerce and manufacturing. Commerce was always part of the Northern region, but now manufacturing has been kicked in. The South hasn't changed either. They're dependent on agriculture. And now we have this Western region that kind of combines the two. They have a lot of agriculture in the West, but they're also developing. They're also growing. So manufacturing is slowly moving in. Now, each one of these regions has that one guy, that political leader in the, in the Congress that seems to have the voice of the region. For the North, it's going to be Daniel Webster. Now, please don't um, confuse Daniel Webster with Noah Webster, the guy who wrote the dictionary. Daniel Webster is going to be from, or not going to be, he was from Massachusetts. Representing the South in this corner, we have John C. Calhoun from South Carolina. And the West, there's our guy, Henry Clay. When you look at the issues that each of these regions had, they liked some stuff, they didn't like other stuff. And that's what's going to cause conflict between the three. For instance, in the North, absolutely supported the tariff. But they were kind of getting down on slavery at this point. Remember, coming out of the American Revolution, all northern states had entered into a period of gradual emancipation. Slavery had been outlawed, and it's on the way out in the north. The south, on the other hand, against the tariff and for slavery. So why would they be against the tariff? And, and the big thing you got to understand is the south relied a lot on sending their goods to Europe. And that tariff is a tax on goods coming from Europe. Well, if European manufacturers are being taxed, 
when they bring their goods into our country. It just stands to reason that when we send our goods to their country, they're going to tax us as well. And that's really going to have an effect on the South and their trade ability. Finally, the West, they just wanted internal improvements. Just build me a road, dude. I want to get my wagon someplace. But these are the goals and the characteristics of these regions that's going to drive what they fight for and what they don't. So when we look at Henry Clay's American system, when it was brought up in front of James Madison, remember, a Democratic Republican, believe it or not, he approves the National Bank. The Second Bank of the United States was chartered in 1816, the last year of his second term. He also approves the protective tariff, which is the tariff of 1860. Go figure. I mean, can you believe this? This is the same guy. James Madison was the Secretary of State under uh, Thomas Jefferson. He had been with Thomas Jefferson and James Monroe as well during Washington's presidency, arguing in the background saying that Hamilton's financial plan will ruin us. And now it's kind of coming back and they're supporting it this time. I guess it's only a bad idea until it's your idea. When it came to the internal improvements, Madison had a different viewpoint. He had a more strict interpretation of the Constitution viewpoint. You see, the National Bank had already been part of the U.S. government. They'd already gone through that fight, so I guess he decided it's not worth fighting anymore. Same with the protective tariff, and we know that the Congress has the power to tax. That's in the Constitution, Article 1, Section 8. But when it comes to internal improvements, Madison is going to argue that that is not the responsibility of the federal government, but instead that should be handled by the states. And he is going to really upset John C. Calhoun because Calhoun is going to introduce what's called the bonus bill. The idea of the bonus bill was for Congress, the federal government, to give money to build roads and canals throughout the western region of our country to make interstate commerce a little bit easier. Madison is going to say that there's nothing in the Constitution that gives the federal government the power to build roads and bridges and stuff in the states. And so that's why he is going to veto the bonus bill, thereby kind of kicking out one major part of the American system. As we come to the end of Madison's presidency, there's some economic decisions that are going to have a long-term effect that Monroe is going to have to deal with. That second bank of the United States is basically the one thing that, you know, the reason it was passed was because there was unsound or paper currency that was being created that was not backed by gold or anything like that. So it didn't have much value. That's what happened when the first bank closed down. So it's going to stop the inflation of paper money because they kept producing more and more and more. And the more you have, the less it's worth. Okay, and that drives prices up and the value of the dollar goes down. It's just not good. It's also going to get us back to having a federal depository, that a place where the American government can put their money, make interest off it, pay loans and stuff like that. This is going to lead to an economic panic that Monroe is going to have to deal with. Now, I know we're still at the end of Madison's presidency. We haven't even gotten into the first term of Monroe, but the Panic of 1819 is a direct result of the Second Bank of the United States. Because when that bank opened, state banks were forced to redeem their paper money, that money that they were printing for specie or coin or gold and silver, hard currency. Banks were starting to demand that their loans get paid off. And what they're gonna say is we're not gonna accept that paper money. And that's gonna create a panic to take off where debtors People who owe the money started selling off their land just to get cash to pay off their loans. As more and more land hit the market to be sold, that drives the price down because there's a lot to choose from. If you have a lot of choices, prices will go down. And you're not going to get as much for your land as you might have, you know, six months ago, a year ago. So you can't pay off your debt. So you're forced into bankruptcy. When you file bankruptcy, the bank loses all that money because you can't pay back your loans. So banks were then forced 
to start trying to get hard currency to pay off their debt. And it just turns into this cycle. And basically, we go into what's known as the Panic of 1819, where you had a lot of bankruptcies, a lot of banks closing, and the value of paper currency just bottoming out. There was no value. That's what Madison left Monroe with. Now, unbeknownst to him, that was going to happen. Because he's leaving in 1816, the panic hat hits three years later. But it's a coming. Henry Clay's American system under James Monroe is a little bit different. We still have, like I said, the National Bank that was signed in for a 20-year commitment, just like the first one. The internal improvements are still on the table. Just because Madison had vetoed it, they're still trying to get them because they're still trying to build trade throughout the Western states. And the protective tariff is still in action. When it came to Monroe's presidency, he is basically going to approve all three. Um, the Erie Canal is going to be built under Monroe's American system. And this is going to be a man-made canal connecting the Great Lakes to New York. And it's going to be used to transport raw materials and manufacture goods much cheaper and much, much faster. On top of that, a national road is going to be built from Cumberland, Maryland, all the way to Vandalia, Illinois. It's known as the Cumberland Road or the National Road. The problem is we're going to have some challenges to some of these decisions within the American system. The first one in 1819, and we're in the Marshall Court now, just to remind you, is going to be McCulloch versus Maryland. With this, the State Bank of Maryland being forced to pay things in specie and hard currency, being forced to you know turn away paper currency and stuff like that, they are actually going to try to tax the Bank of the United States. Basically, you are in our region, so we're going to tax you. And the Bank of the United States sued Maryland, saying you cannot tax a federal entity. It goes to Marshall, who is the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. Remember, he was appointed by Adams, one of the midnight appointments, he, he decided the case of Marbury v. Madison, which gives the Supreme Court the power of judicial review. And so now he is still on the Supreme Court, and his court rule in favor of the bank. They said that the state does not have the power to tax a federal entity. And the primary reasons he gave for that is federalism, the supremacy clause, the elastic clause, and implied powers. Basically, the Elastic Clause, let's talk about that one first, because that's how Hamilton got the bank passed in the first place. It's also known as the Necessary and Proper Clause. Well, that basically says the bank is constitutional. Then we get into the question of federalism, the division of power between the state and the federal government. And Marshall says that the states do not have the power to tax the federal government. And that falls under the Supremacy Clause. The Supremacy Clause of the United States Constitution says that the Constitution is the law of the land. And if the law of the land says that the Bank of the United States is constitutional and a federal entity, then states cannot infringe on federal government power. That's all part of the implied powers. Implied powers refer to the powers of the Constitution that are given to the government. So basically what Marshall said was, Dude, we're the federal government, you're a state government, we're supreme, you're lower. You can't infringe on our power. And with that, the federal government became just a little bit stronger. But that wasn't the only case that happened during Monroe's presidency that had high implications with regards to federal and state relationships. Within his decision... Marshall stated that the power to tax involves the power to destroy. And if states have the power to tax the federal government, that gives states the power to destroy the federal government. And we can't have that. But that wasn't the only case that Marshall and the Supreme Court heard regarding this division of power between state and federal governments. The next one I want to talk to you about briefly is Gibbons v. Ogden. Basically, this was a case in 1824, right at the end of Monroe's presidency, where you had two competing uh, steamboat companies on the Hudson River. New Jersey had given one of those companies a monopoly. New York had given the other company a monopoly. 
And they were fighting who has the monopoly, who has control of the trade along the Hudson River. Well, Marshall stepped in and said, neither one of you do. See, under federalism, the division of power between the state and the federal government the federal government reigns over interstate trade. That's the Commerce Clause of the U.S. Constitution. The Congress shall have the power to regulate commerce with foreign nations and among the several states. So where you had two states trying to control interstate trade, Marshall stepped in and said, neither one of you have control. Both shipping companies can use the Hudson River, and the states never had the power to give that away to you. So he ruled in favor of the federal government, once again, proving the strength of the federal government. So that's three cases now we've seen thus far where each decision has slowly increased the power of the federal government. Marbury v. Madison, Judicial Review. Um, McCulloch v. Maryland, the Federalism and the Supremacy Clause. And now Gibbons v. Ogden, Interstate Commerce. And the federal government controls all of that. So with every decision that Marshall made, we see the power of the federal government increasing. When we look at Monroe's foreign policy, he's not most known for the Monroe Doctrine, but he also had some major developments with regards to land holdings in the United States. His Secretary of State, uh, John Quincy Adams, is going to negotiate all these and be very proficient in increasing our, the size of our country. The Anglo-American Convention in 1818 was a agreement between us and Great Britain. We both occupied Oregon at the time, so we decided to share it for the next 10 years. It's also going to set the northern border of the Louisiana Territory at the 49th parallel. Absolutely divide that land between Canada and the United States. That wasn't enough. The adams onis Treaty of 1818 Adams is going to go and negotiate a treaty with Spanish to bring Florida into the United States. We're able to not only acquire Florida from Spain, but we also we gave up our claim to Texas, which is kind of how we sweeten the pot for Spain. But don't worry, we're going to get Texas eventually. I mean, we always get everything eventually. Within the Western Hemisphere, things were heating up, to be honest with you. In Latin America, you had several countries that had won their independence from Spain and Portugal. They were trying to be like us. They were fighting revolutions for independence. And we love a good revolution for independence. But we were concerned. You see, Europe wasn't fighting anymore. And we were worried that Europe was looking back to the Americas. There were these fears amongst American politicians that European countries were going to start trying to recolonize the Western Hemisphere. And honestly, England's a little bit worried about that, too. Now, why would England be worried about this? Well, primarily because they trade with the Western Hemisphere and they don't want any competition. Not only that, you have another player coming into the game. The Russians! The Russians are coming. They have started to colonize the Pacific Northwest. And that's a little bit concerning to us. Because, of you know, they're up there in Alaska. And they're setting up trading posts along the Western Coast. It's a concern, but it's not much we're going to deal with right now. But we're definitely keeping an eye on it. All this going on is going to lead to what's known as the Monroe Doctrine. From Monroe's Doctrine, it says the American continents were henceforth not to be considered as subjects for future colonization by any European powers. Basically, what the Monroe Doctrine says is that the United States is not going to permit any new colonization in the Western Hemisphere. Now, there's, it's not going to have an immediate effect on a lot of things, but man, down the road, this Monroe Doctrine plays a huge role in our relationship with Latin American countries. It was signed in December of 1823, and like I said, Monroe said we are closed for colonization. It also said we were going to stay out of European affairs. Basically, you guys stay on your side of the world, we'll stay on ours. But if we see European countries coming over into our neck of the woods, we're going to see that as dangerous to our peace and to our safety. So you stay over there, guys. We'll stay over here. And this becomes one of the major legacies of James Monroe and his presidency. America seems to be becoming this player on the world stage. But it's really easy to be a major player when you have the power of England behind you.
And that's what this cartoon represents. And I've always liked this one, where it has James Monroe holding off all the European power, saying, you stay out of here. Don't worry about that big you know, English empire standing behind me. They're Just ignore them. So there you have it, the Monroe presidency. Now, there's still a little bit more to talk about, but I want to devote an entire video to that. That's going to be the question of Missouri and how it actually leads to the very first crisis in our union. But that's on the next video. Thanks for watching. And like always, if you miss something, you can always go back to the beginning and watch it again. I mean, heck, I need the views. And don't forget to subscribe. We'll see you on the next one. Bye-bye.